Robbie Fowler is one of the most naturally gifted strikers the English Premier League and in my opinion the game as a whole has ever seen. The tale of his career is one of thrilling highs and crushing lows, of adoration and controversy and of course a shed load of goals. This is the story of his first spell at Liverpool. Fowler was born and bred in Liverpool and grew up on Merseyside, aligned to the blue half of the city as an Everton supporter. However, after being discovered by scout Jim Aspinall and taken into Liverpool's centre of excellence, he switched allegiances. Fowler has this to say about his early days. When I was very young, I used to watch them, but I was at Liverpool when I was 11 years old. I've been a Liverpool fan from then on. Obviously, I grew up watching very, very good Everton sides, but I always knew deep down Liverpool were a better team. Before I was 14 years old, I had a chance to sign for Everton, but being at Liverpool, I was quite a loyal lad, and because they had raised me, I just didn't want to jump ship. At that time, it would have been easier to get into the Everton first team, but I stuck to my guns and I'm happy with the decision that I made. Fowler was highly rated at every level the youth set up as his innate goal scoring talents were there for all to see and records tumbled beneath his golden boots. Aspinall had this to say about Robbie, he knew when and where to put the ball and run into space. He had such a lovely touch. Unsurprisingly, Liverpool rushed to secure the services of their young prodigy and signed him on a professional contract as soon as he turned 17. Fowler would enjoy a dream debut as he found the back of the net and assisted the other two goals in a 3-0 first leg League Cup win over Fulham on the 22nd of September 1993. What Fowler did two weeks later in the second leg at Anfield was truly special. On just his fourth start for the club, 18-year-old Fowler would score all five goals in the match, announcing himself in some style as a talent to be taken seriously. Manager at the time Graeme Souness had this to say after the match. He's played four games now and everyone is going to know his name. We will do our best to make sure his life does not change one bit. I do not want to go overboard about him but I think he's going to be very special. Souness didn't get much right as manager of Liverpool but he was spot on with that one. The following week Fowler was to the rescue as he would be so often for the Reds to equalise against lowly Oldham in the 83rd minute before a fortunate own goal 7 minutes later would see Liverpool win and their blushes spared even though they played poorly. Despite missing 2 months of the season due to sustaining a broken leg in an FA Cup tie with Bristol City, Fowler would enjoy a rather decent first season for Liverpool. He would end up with a tally of 18 goals in all competitions and 12 in the Premier League. Highlights of that season included a hat-trick against Southampton, about which Fowler said this, anyone would be pleased to score 3 in the Premiership, so I'd say it's better than the 5 I got in the Coca-Cola Cup, and a brace against Spurs in a thrilling 3-3 draw at White Hart Lane, which prompted Souness to lavish further praise on the player who was quickly becoming his crown jewel. Robbie Fowler has been playing like that week in week out he said. He could be as good as anything in my time in football. How could you fail to be excited by what he did today? The real winners were the people who came to watch the game. Souness would ultimately pay the price for too many poor results as he was replaced by Roy Evans as Liverpool ended the 93-94 season 8th in the Premier League. Fowler was the team's second highest goal scorer, having bagged one less than club legend Ian Rush despite playing 15 games fewer than the veteran striker. And I feel now it's as good a time as any to talk about Rush a bit, as he played a key role in the development of Fowler. Rush is Liverpool's all-time leading goalscorer, with 346 goals in all competitions for the Reds. Much like Fowler, Rush was an instinctive and natural finisher. He was an intelligent forward and earned the nickname The Ghost, due to his excellent positional awareness and ability to nip in behind defenders taking them by surprise. He was quick, had a silky touch and was great with his head, much like a certain number 23. The Welshman was 32 by the time Fowler broke through and although no longer at the peak of his powers, Fowler clearly took a great deal from his time training and sharing a pitch with the great Ian Rush. In Robbie's own words, Since I've been in the side, the service to the front bend has been really good. Anyone who doesn't learn from Ian Rush needs shooting. If the 93-94 season put Fowler on the map, then the following year was going to launch him into the stratosphere and he wouldn't look back. The Talks of Terror started the season off by chipping in with a goal in Red's 6-1 demolition of Crystal Palace. If he only had a supporting role in that game, then he stole the whole show and all the headlines for himself the following week. On the 26th minute of the game against Arsenal, Jamie Redknapp delivered a great free kick into the box. The ball fortuitously flicked off captain Ian Rush and into the path of Fowler, who finished with the predator's instinct that the world was getting to know so well. 
Three minutes later, Steve McManaman drove 60 yards up the pitch unchallenged, slipped a lovely ball through to Fowler, who managed to direct a low, left-footed shot into the bottom right corner, despite being closed down by Lee Dixon. The Cobb had barely gotten their breath back, when 90 seconds later, John Barnes sent Fowler on his way once more, with a great lobbed past, and he managed to stick it away at the second time of asking, from a tight angle after a save from David Seaman. This hat-trick in 4 minutes 33 seconds was the fastest in Premier League history, a record which stood for 20 odd years until Sadio Mane managed to hit 3 in 2 minutes 56 seconds for Southampton in 2015. The 19 year old had this to say about his marvellous feat. I didn't really have a clue today's goals came so quickly, I thought they were 15 minutes apart. New manager Roy Evans was keen to keep feet on the ground. Though the lad Fowler is obviously an immense talent, frightening, but it's about other people as well, and he's got to learn to appreciate what they do for him. I think he's getting there. The fans weren't so keen to keep grounded after what they saw and anointed him as god after that match. Fowler would be a constant in the team throughout the season, as he started every single one of Liverpool's 57 matches. He bagged 31 goals in all competitions and 25 in the Premier League, which included braces against Aston Villa, Ipswich, Chelsea and Norwich. His unbelievable form saw him pick up the PFA Young Player of the Year award, and it looked as though he would be a capable replacement for the ageing rush, although not everybody thought it was possible or fair that they should have a ready-made successor for the legendary striker. Liverpool had made a considerable improvement under Evans that season, as they finished 4th in the league and won the League Cup. The following season, Fowler would continue to feature prominently and score heavily, supported by new striking partner and £8 million summer arrival Stan Collymore. Fowler would again breach the 30 goals mark, netting 36 in all competitions and enjoying his most prolific season in the Prem, with an awesome total of 28 in the competition. Notable highlights of that season include his 4 goals in the 5-2 route of Bolton, which Robbie said this about after the game. This probably topped the lot. You can score 5 goals in the League Cup against lesser sides, but if you come in the Premiership and score 4, I think it is brilliant. I made up anyway. I know I've not been around such a long time, but it's as good a Liverpool side as I have played in. John Barnes said after the Tottenham game last season that we were playing as a team of individuals, but we are playing more of a team game now. He also grabbed another hat-trick against the Gunners, although not a record-smashing one this time, and his exceptional performance in that match prompted high praise and comparisons from Evans. They were fantastic goals from Robbie. Three clinical finishes. I'm not trying to force Terry Venables, and I know Robbie is in his mind. His last two performances will have helped him. Unlike the Dutch striker Patrick Kluivert, he's shown that if you are good enough, you're old enough. Robbie certainly has that big match temperament. He's the least nervous of all our players coming into a big match. For a lad of his age, his record is phenomenal. He's up there with the best of them. He also scored a brace in the thrilling 4-3 match against Newcastle, which stopped them from going top and kept Liverpool in a title race. That game would later be voted match of the decade. The 20-year-old Fowler was again awarded the PFA Young Player of the Year as Liverpool finished third in the league and made it to the FA Cup final only to lose 1-0 to Man United at Wembley, a team which he had scored 4 goals against that season. The 96-97 season would see Fowler occupy the number 9 shirt vacated by the departing rush, and set a record which still hasn't been broken to this day. He would end the season with 31 goals in all competitions, 18 in the Premier League, making him the only player ever to score more than 30 goals a season in each of their first three full seasons in England. The match against Middlesbrough on 14th of December 1996 saw him break another record in impressive fashion. The four goals he scored against Borough that day saw him reach 100 for the club, hitting the century mark one game quicker than his mentor Ian Rush, managing it in only 165 games. Another interesting incident that season was would see Fowler awarded with the UEFA Fair Play Award. After going down under what appeared to be a late challenge from keeper David Seaman, the ref awarded a penalty against the Arsenal goalkeeper. Fowler protested, trying to convince the referee that he hadn't been fouled and that no penalty should be given. The ref didn't listen and Fowler took the penalty, which Seaman then saved. Although it was widely thought that Fowler had missed the penalty on purpose to try and deliver some sort of justice, he later denied this. As a goal scorer, it's part of my job to take it, and I wanted to score it. I tried to score, I never missed on purpose. It just happened. It was a bad penalty. Fowler's 97-98 season would be cut short due to a horrendous anterior cruciate ligament injury he received from a collision with Everton goalkeeper Thomas Meyer. Fowler would say this about his injury after he retired. Obviously, I was desperately disappointed, because I was playing well, I was still young, 
I remember waking up from the operation with a big gap in my leg. I did every ligament in my knee and I can remember thinking I was finished. I actually cried to be honest. I was on the verge of signing a new contract and now I wasn't sure where that was going. Thankfully I got back but I probably wasn't the same player afterwards. He would go on to miss the 98 World Cup in France and if there is one small positive to be taken from such a disappointing situation it's that it sped up the emergence of one Michael Owen. The 18 year old established himself as Liverpool's first choice striker in Fowler's absence, ended the season with 18 goals in the Premier League and the Golden Boot, the PFA Young Player of the Year award and a call up to England's World Cup squad where he would announce himself on the world stage with one of the all time great goals against Argentina. When Farrell looks back on that injury, he wonders what could have been. I was one of the more unlucky players in terms of injuries and operations, whereas some players can play a whole career and not get anything. But it's all hypothetical. I could have gone on to become the best in the world. There was a World Cup that summer which I missed, but maybe not. You can't think too much about it. On 19th of September 1998, Fowler scored a brace on his Premier League return from that knee injury in a 3-3 draw as he partnered Michael Lowen in attack. That season would see the Liverpool hierarchy attempt a bizarre experiment in the form of a managerial partnership with Roy Evans and Gerard Houllier, a venture which lasted only months as the proud Evans resigned in November 98. Fowler saw his game time decrease as Houllier looked to shape the squad in his image and this meant a clear out of some of the more colourful elements of the squad. You see, during the mid to late 90s Fowler and his his teammates, mainly David James, Jason McAteer, Jamie Redknapp and Robbie's best friend Steve McManaman had been making headlines for their off-field lifestyles. They were dubbed the Spice Boys, a derogatory nickname born from the unfounded tabloid rumour that Fowler was dating Spice Girl Emma Bunton, Baby Spice. This generation of highly gifted young footballers was predicted to bring success and titles to Liverpool, but they failed to live up to expectations leading the media to speculate they were underperforming due to distractions such as all night parties and photo shoots. No incident sums up that Spice Boy era or added to this idea of the lads being all mouth no trousers more than the matching cream coloured Armani suits that the team turned up to Wembley in for the FA Cup final they lost to Man United. Jason McAteer had this to say when reflecting on that time. In reality we were not the Spice Boys, although Robbie Fowler could have been ugly Spice. The fact is, we were a very professional bunch of lads and didn't deserve the reputation that that nickname gave us. We got it because people saw us as underachievers who liked to go out. There was a social culture in football at the time. We were doing nothing more than the players at Arsenal or Manchester United. Gerard wanted to change that side and bring in lads, mainly foreign lads, who had been taught differently from a young age and were not so used to the social side. And so it was that in the summer of 99, Houllier got rid of a bunch of Spice Boys. David James and McAteer were sold and McManaman left on a free transfer. The 99-2000 season would be Robbie's worst to date as he managed only 3 goals in 14 appearances as Houllier started to phase him out of the squad. The 2000-2001 season was Fowler's most successful as he won a unique cup treble with the Reds. The first trophy came in the form of a League Cup where Fowler captained the side in the final against Birmingham and scored a goal in the 30th minute. Liverpool would go on to win on penalties and lift the cup. Fowler was named Man of the Match. Fowler would score an important goal in Liverpool's run to the FA Cup final a free kick in the semis against Wickham Wanderers. He would come on as a 77th minute substitute in the final against Arsenal when Liverpool were 1-0 up to help his team flip the match on his head and end up eventual 2-1 winners courtesy of two Michael Owen goals. Their third success of the season came in the UEFA Cup where Liverpool played out one of the all-time classic European finals against Spanish side Alaves. Fowler would come on as a substitute in the 64th minute with the game tied at 3 all. Nine minutes later, Robbie would score and the Reds would take the lead. Alaves weren't done and Jordi Cruyff equalised in the 89th minute to send the final to extra time. An own goal would see Liverpool victorious and Fowler left the UEFA Cup. Although Fowler enjoyed great success that season, he often found himself on the bench as Houllier favoured a strike pairing of Owen and Heskey. The following season began in tumultuous fashion for Fowler as he was at loggerheads with the manager due to his decision to drop him from the squad for the first game of the season, the Charity Shield match against Man United. This was at a time when contract talks with Fowler were at a delicate stage, with the bosses at Anfield being clear that if Robbie refused to make up his mind in time and sign on the dotted line, they would sell him, as they were keen to avoid a repeat of the Steve McManaman debacle which saw their £12 million rated star move to Madrid on a Bosman. Fowler would accuse 
accuse Hulli of forcing him out of the club. The French manager would berate and degrade Robbie in front of his teammates, and even went as far as trying to manipulate local newspapers to misreporting on Robbie. Robbie's last game for Liverpool in his first spell would come against Sunderland on 25th November 2001. Hulier would hook him at half time in a bid to strengthen the midfield. That kind of sums up my time under Hulier, would be Fowler's verdict years later. He would transfer to Leeds in a £12 million deal and make his debut for the club in December 2001. Hulier had succeeded in forcing a devastated Fowler out of the club that he loved. Robbie Fowler's first spell at Liverpool may be as well remembered for the number of controversial incidents he was involved in as the number of goals he scored. In March 1997, Fowler celebrated scoring against Brandon Bergen in the Cup Winners' Cup by lifting his jersey to display a mock Calvin Klein t-shirt which showed support for the sacked Liverpool dock workers. He received a fine of £900 from UEFA for doing so. On the 27th of February 1999, Fowler was involved in an infamous incident with Chelsea defender Graham Lasso at Stamford Bridge. After Fowler had fouled the soul, the Chelsea left back stayed down to receive treatment. Fowler began to wave his arse at Lasso, shouting homophobic taunts while Lasso's wife and children watched in the stand. Graham talks about this incident at length in his biography, as well as providing some context about how his whole career had been marred by teammates, opponents and fans calling him gay and pelting him with homophobic slurs, and this incident he states as being the most humiliating and infuriating in his career. One week later, Fowler was again in hot water after scoring an equalising penalty against bitter rivals Everton. Robbie got to his knees and began to snort the white lines of Anfield as if he was doing a huge line of cocaine. Hulier ridiculously tried to explain it away as Robbie trying to eat the grass, in tribute to Cameroonian ritual that he had learned from teammate Rigobert Song. The real reason is that Robbie and his family had for years endured abuse from Everton supporters that he was a heavy drug user or a junkie. Fowler would say this about his infamous celebration. In recent years, I have felt depressed and deeply saddened by the allegations about drug abuse that have been continuously leveled at me. These accusations not only affected me on the ground, but also hurt my family's feelings. When asked if he regretted the celebration, this was Fowler's response. No chance. I used to get absolutely mullered by Everton fans, so I was always going to do it. I knew what I was doing. I didn't care. It was a chance to wind them up after all the abuse they'd given me. Fowler received a record £32,000 fine and a six-match suspension for both of those incidents. So, that's the story of Fowler's first spell with Liverpool, a generational goal-scoring talent destroyed by injuries and poor management. Thanks for watching.